Now, we'll open up to questions from the uh, floor. Hannah, please. Yep. Um, for the panel. Uh, at the back there. Um, I'm uh, particularly, because I see, uh, I'm want to talk and raise the issue of the regional growth plans, which I was pleased to hear actually mentioned by some of the panel. Um, I see uh, local government's role now is to actually uh, participate in those regional growth plans and, and protect ourselves. And this is about sustainable economic local economy. We've got to understand our local economy. We have to protect ourselves against bad state and federal plans and policies. And that's the firewall, which was the last panel speaker talked about firewalling. So in our far western Victoria, uh, we're talking about beyond blue, beyond blue guns, we actually had uh, attacks and lack of planning controls uh, through um, uh, uh, <coughs> Premier Jeff Kennett's era. We actually allowed a development that ended up devaluing our land, which is our asset base. We don't have parking meters and that sort of uh, rate revenue. So we actually have land now that's worth less, so we get less rates for that land that produces less compared to the farming land. Now we have a fire services levy, so my agricultural uh, sheep, cattle, cropping country is going to be paying my, more fire services levy than the blue gum plantations nearby. So, and now we have a regional growth plan that actually shadows in the far west saying it is sustainable and efficient forestry. Now my apologies to the areas where there is sustainable and efficient forestry that isn't built on a wood chip industry that was pushed by tax and we don't own the land now. That's by the by, but our regional councils and rural councils need to understand our economy and have the street. We've, had, we've talked about community consultation down to the community. Where's the community consultation back up to government? Because we get, we're going to get a whole, we're going to have a real, real action on trees and uh, what's that going to look like? We're not told what it's going to look like. And all we had with this blue gum industry was a retirement plan. It wasn't a growth plan and sustainable use of that. It didn't take into consideration the water consumption, the effect on communities, the effect on roads. So what I'm just saying is that understand your local economy, get that community, con don't, don't be disparaging about community consultation because there was nothing when it came to rolling out the managed investment schemes in blue gums. And it also affected the horticultural area. I went to the rally up when I was running as a Liberal candidate in 2006, talked to the people up there. It's really, um, we've got to understand our economy and don't let daft policies get rolled out and work, be more vigorous in communicating with state and federal, federal levels of government uh, where we want to be. Um, and, uh, and it can come from that community consultation because there's sensible people out there that want to see the full plan. Thank you. So I actually mentioned uh, Get Ridge of Road Plan, so thanks Katrina, and I think that's really, really important. There's several opportunities in the framework, because all we've done is create a framework. Mm -hmm. One of the most important things that I would encourage you to use in regional growth plans is to see that they're not necessarily just clear winners <coughs> and losers in terms of population growth and population decline, but we can actually work through regional growth plans to actually see that areas of decline can be can, can share in some of the areas of growth in terms of li living patterns, in terms of tourism patterns, in terms of other economic development. It's what we make out of them, so it's a really good collaborative framework. Re and the other important thing, so not only in themselves are they desperately important, but regional strategic plans and regional growth plans have offered new levels of co collaboration between regional councils that can in themselves shape the basis of future collaboration around shared service delivery and so many other things. But really key opportunities around regional growth plans, use them for all their worth because it, it, it's, a, it's an important opportunity for it. Thank you. My question is really uh, about are we overthinking and overcomplicating the election process and recognition process? I think um, Anne mentioned that um, somebody didn't know who they voted for. I probably couldn't tell you who I voted for in the Senate, and certainly I've had um, people come up to me and say they're going to vote for me on Saturday. Um, and um, I've had people ask me why Peter Crisp wasn't, didn't re-elect himself for council. So 
you know, the general community, I think there's a lot of people out there really don't know who the heck they're voting for, they don't really care, they're over the whole lot of us. Um, so is that really an issue? Um, are we just getting too hung up on those processes and maybe too hung up on change for the sake of change? I'll have a go. <laughs> I suspect it's an issue for a lot of people simply because of the way <coughs> elections are being reported in such finite, irrelevant detail by the press. And my personal view is it's that it has a lot to do with um, the immediacy required by the networks for the quick grab instead of in detail analysis of what a policy imperative might mean as far as candidates concerned, that we are focused on the star candidate or the leader of the party as opposed to the, the policies of the party and what they mean for the individual. And so it's almost as if we've transformed elections into a rock star principle instead of what it's really about, which is about democracy. And also um, the constant attention that's given to things in television series, etc., about the capacity to get immediate results for everything, and a lot of the stuff that comes through on our television about the way the American system works, as, and I think people have probably got a better understanding of how the American constitution works rather than the Australian constitution. And I think all those things coalesce together to give us the sort of picture that you've painted for people. And we've built a culture in communities in terms of certainly federal elections maybe a little bit in the state, but more so federal. What does an election mean for me and not for the country or not for the municipality or not for the state? And so it's a me, me, me culture rather than what's good for the country or the entity as a whole. Uh, that goes back to this whole question of entitlement, right? We've overblown ourselves to the entitlement. We're living beyond our means. Whether that's families, whether it's local government, whether it's state, whether it's federal, we are running into a brick wall. And I don't quite know what the answer is because I'm not sure anyone has the courage to do what's necessary, least of all the public who keep demanding these things. Secondly, uh, in terms of councils and people not knowing who they're voting for, in part that's true because we've got three tiers of government. We always seem to be going to the polls, which is a problem. Uh, but secondly, you also have very good examples of where characters provide leadership in municipalities or state government or federal government, where people do know. So you can go, and maybe Kyle is one up in her electorate because she seems to talk a lot. You go to Noosey, you have a big old bob. No, no, when I say talk a lot, but you see it going firm and you get out and people know you come up to your ring. There are many municipalities where the mayor could walk down the street and no one would know who they are. That's because of a failure of presentation, a failure of leadership. Uh, you can go to Newsom, oh, I've forgotten his name, the, the guy who used to run Newsom before the failed amalgamations up there, uh, Bob, uh, what was it? No, no, no. <laughs> what was his name? Bob well, Ensign. No, 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 close to it though. Yeah. Huge man, big man, yeah. real character, really did very, very well. Uh, you talked about regional growth plans. Unless you do those regional growth plans in consultation, close consultation with state governments, etc., etc., it's a waste of bloody time. Because you can work your bug off, put out the best plan, but if there isn't an understanding of the plan, if there isn't a priority that lines up with the state and you, or if you can't discuss to come to common ground, why put in all the effort? We're spending so much time, so many inquiries, so many bits and pieces that don't actually lead anywhere. So, I'm very interested in the comments from our friend from uh, Canada. You know, it is about place. And a lot of places have a lot of character. Not many metropolitan municipalities have much character. They just run one on to the other. But, uh, well, some do. Well, well, some do. Some do. But in the main, character is more associated with locations. Different places. Why I'm worried about what's happening down in 
uh, south western Victoria with all the dairy farmers in so much trouble. Uh, but people have to be proactive. We can either wait till we hit the wall and then others will make the decision that was suggested earlier, or we become more collaborative, try to anticipate what's going to happen, share our services better, be prepared to put community ahead of actually being the councillor for this particular area. I'm, I'm a member of a golf club and I was absolutely excited the other day, it's the second or third year golf club down on the morning to Peninsula, to get a letter from my president and say he and another golf club have started the process to merge, because neither on their own do they think will be sustainable in five or ten years' time. Now, there's many golf courses in that condition. There's many municipalities in that condition right now. So it's better to actually bring about change while you've got some say, rather than have someone in the local government department come in and say, well, you failed, that is what we're going to do. So the real challenge for local government, as I see it right now, is knowing that you're going to hit the wall as a generalisation. What can you do better to be sustainable for 2050? And how do you see Victoria's municipalities in 2100? 2100 is not that far away. My granddaughter, born a couple of weeks ago, will be alive in 2100, which simplifies the passage of time. <laughs> Where does anyone see local government in 35 years, in 2100? And unless you've got some picture of it, then we're going to continue to flower it. If I could just add to Jeff's um, comment there about entitlement, I mean, an example I can think about in, in our municipality is the fact, like, of kindergartens. There, it just wasn't possible to run a kindergarten in every town. So some of those towns now, they'll actually bus children in, they come in from one you know, area into another. And it took a little bit of change, but once people realised that if we work together, singularly we can do a bit, but together we can do a heck of a lot more. And that was sort of some of those change around that. And where to? We want this to be sustainable for the future, for our children and our children's children. So how are we going to work about that now? And I mean, I'm not saying our towns aren't parochial. They are. I mean, um, I live in Warrantville and my children play sport in Yula, which is a big taboo because we're playing outside our town. But I think it's about, you know, without trying to sound modest, it is about that leadership as well. It's about showing that we are a whole municipality. And if we have that service somewhere within here and we can get to it, we still have it. It's either a move to do it or lose it sometimes and I think breaking down those barriers and working together is the way we do that, whether that is across our towns or, you know, again, that partnership of our communities working with our Shire and our council to achieve that. Yeah. yeah, John, just two, two quick points. Um, with increasing urbanisation, um, who and how you elect your local leaders is important because take the example of the East West Link that a lot of people have tossed out. In a lot of countries of the world, including mine, that would be a decision made locally and then financed by the other two levels of government. Uh, I don't get that impression that that's what's happened here. So, um, and the reason I just use that one as a proxy for the discussion is because the increasing urbanization is going to create, in the power structure, very different relationships between those that represent these large urban agglomerations. And the expectations of those citizens in those communities, even if they're large urban agglomerations, to have a direct say in some of the way those decisions are made. That's one. The second one, in terms of regionalization, if you look at what's happened around the globe, um, in cases where some jurisdictions wanted to force a regional structure, by and large those regional structures are made up of appointed people from state levels of government, who then have more uh, legal authority, not moral authority because they're not elected, legal authority because they're appointed directly by those state levels, and they ride roughshod in the worst possible cases over mayors and local councils. So I think it is important that there's clarity and knowledge around who you're voting for, what their roles are, what their roles are going to be in regional discussions, because like everybody up here, you can't actually run the world today. It's too complex and it's too um, connected not to have regional growth plans. But be careful that those don't become another way of altering the power structure rather than one of forcing collaboration amongst people who are elected. Is that have really excited and stimulated me that has been said across the panel. Jeff, you talked about 
of clarity, roles and responsibilities. I remember as chair of the Local Government Planning Advisory Council in 97, 1996 mentioning that our council took that as advice to the Minister Rob McClellan. He took a bex and had a good lie down. With regard, to, with regard to the opportunity for change to occur, the devolution of services to local government stated would lead possibly to the amalgamation or consolidation of local government. If we look at that as then an opportunity for a powerful thrust to remove state government, wouldn't that be an exciting future for Australia in the decision making process? I'm sure the candidate doesn't want to comment on this. Uh, <laughs> but yes, of course it would. If, you have, if you're starting with a, white, a new whiteboard, you'd only have two tiers of government in this country, and that would come overcome the gentleman's question about people not knowing who they're voting for, etc. But we haven't. And uh, the reality is, I've never seen a group of politicians vote for their own demise. Uh, so it's unlikely to happen. Therefore, why spend a lot of energy on something that's not going to occur? Why not try and spend the energy making the three tiers work better? My concern with it is also that if you've got to state governments tomorrow, which you, I mean, it's not impossible, it could happen, uh, the condition of our local government is not anywhere near good enough for the reasons Jeff's outlined and some of the others here today, to take on the responsibility. And although groups try and provide the leadership like the MAV for councils. Councils are a bit like farmers. Farmers do not have as powerful a voice as they should have in this country because they are farmers. They might be dairy farmers who try and come together and be farmers. But they don't get the recognition they deserve because they're disparate. So if a car manufacturer falls in a hole, which might employ 2,000 people at one site, governments rush in and throw money at them because you can immediately see this building closed down and all those people lose their jobs. But there'll be more than that being driven off the land every week. And no one gives a damn. So until local government defines a way of lifting the professionalism among, in, uh, as a generalisation, among councillors and officers, unless they can prove themselves ready to take on that extra responsibility, then I think you're going to be stuck with state governments. The test is then, if you're going to try and undertake that activity, you're probably going to have to bring about some further amalgamations. Because there are so many councils in this community, we've got 78, I think it is in Victoria, 79, sorry, yes, they made one mistake. Um, <laughs> 79, some of them are terribly, terribly small. They simply couldn't function if, in fact, they took on more of the services and requirements uh, that the Bureau Advocate was saying before, and they remain the same size they are. I mean, it's a great concept. Could be done. Um, Councillor Michelle Klein from Manningham City. Uh, Jeff, thank you for some of the things that you said, very good points. Going back on the, we said we're living beyond our means, and um, governments are, the pay scale is way too high, it's out of proportion out of touch and as a council um, in talking with our council budget that was a big issue for us. You may mention that with regards to super for uh, councils to be sustainable we need to look at you know two percent no higher over the next few years. Something again that we spoke about as councillors um, was around those sort of figures and what came back to us was well you do that the unions are going to go ballistic how is that going to happen? And we said, well, you know, that's going to mean jobs. It's going to be meaning doing the same amount of, of work with the same amount of money. That will mean less people. And so be it necessarily. But I'd like to, to ask, you know, any other suggestions that you've, you've got for us? If we were to look at that and go back to council, because, you know, that was a struggle for us in, in trying to say, well, we can't afford to keep going up because the rate payer pays. And you've suggested that. We've heard that, but that's been a struggle. I'm not saying it's easy. Yeah. In fact, life is not going to be easy over the next few years in this country. Yeah. But you've got to cut your clock to suit. Yeah. I mean, you don't do it. You, in our own household, most of us try and manage and pay our mortgages. We live within our means. Why is it when we assume public service that we don't apply the same level of governance? And if it's unpleasant, so be it. 
The alternative is you'll lose control of your own destiny. So that what will happen within three years, if in fact the super fund doesn't get the returns that requires and the salaries go up, you're going to have to put in, I don't know what you put in this year, 15 million or something? What was the, what was your super? Seven. Seven. Well, seven million. So that seven million you may have borrowed, it's seven million you haven't got for infrastructure, so you're going backwards the whole time. Uh, but this is happening in every tier of government. You know, the people I admire most in Australia, if we were under attack, I'd be finding out and calling on every single person. Not barriers, not pensioners, single persons. Between the ages of 20 and 65, there's three and a half million singles in this country. Yes, some will be on un unemployment benefits, but in the main they're single. They get nothing from governments. No parental leave, no programs after school, nothing. They work hard, they pay all their taxes, they're self-resilient, even when they go on holidays, as my sister is a single lady now, she books a room at cabin on a boat, she's got to pay for two bloody people because she's on her own. So single people have got a much better appreciation of living within their means than the rest of us who keep putting up our hands saying, we want this, we want that. Where's it all going to end? Can I add to that, please? That's just a one, one comment. Look, I take the point on this. We've seen a lot of discussion in the economy and, and the political debate about the cost of doing business and our relative um, economic positioning and, and uh, the cost of, cost, of, uh, cost of our workforce. But I just would encourage, so I'm not, I'm not disputing how important that issue is, as Jeff's responded to or how difficult it is. But I also think there is, as it gets back to that core proposition that we were discussing over the last two days, I know we voted on it before lunch, about whether local government is in the business as its core business of service delivery or community government. I know there were some divided views about that. But I do think we have to put everything into the you know, fundamental rethink box. And that is things that we have just said, oh, we need one of those, we need someone to do this because... Well, we're council, so we, we have to do it that way. Well, perhaps we don't. Uh, shared services, I, I don't necessarily like the term because people jump into certain views or models that they've seen. But whether it's shared services, whether it's other patterns of collaboration, other patterns of outsourcing, new technologies, or, or combination of all those things, I just think what we have to do with a whole lot of our services, and I appreciate some councils have already done this and looking always at ways of improving the saving costs, but the fundamental rethink, and not just working on assumptions, we need that, but how do we uniquely provide this service in a way that's really going to meet needs, but perhaps in completely different ways that actually uh, gets better outcomes and reduce cost? I think there's a big issue still there. Sorry, can I just... Sorry, sorry, I'll take this. The thing is, how do you get a sense of urgency in the local government? That's the real issue right now. Because the hourglass is running out. Now, all right, there are some councils that are in a good position, they're bigger as that. But for a lot more, there's this tsunami coming towards us of revenue, and threat for revenue, and expectation and provision. And we do need this review of roles, very, very urgently. And if it doesn't come from the top down, it ought to go from the bottom up. So that you guys should come together and be very clear and articulate about what you think it is that local government should be providing for the next 15, 20 years. And you should be taking that leadership up there to the state and hopefully including the state to take it to federal level. If you do nothing, if there's no sense of urgency, I tell you what, you'll be here in five years' time. Well, sorry, half of you will be here in five years' time. Because <laughs> the councils will have disappeared. And can I add to that, John, please? Um, and I don't think you can have that conversation without being really informed about what that your community individually values. And I don't think we're at that point. I think we assume we know what our community values. And it's, it's not a question of knowing the demographics and, and having a sort of a basic life stages understanding of what people want at particular life stages. It's about having the understanding of the values of the community, because I think we'd be very surprised that if we knew that, how we could have a conversation with our community about what we might not do or how we might do things differently. Sharon Ellis, Council of the City of Whitehalls. 
Um, I was interested in the comment that um, Marie Antoinette made before about the importance of place. And that's a recurring theme um, in our municipality, especially up my end of town, that they're going to be losing their neighbourhood character with development, their sense of community, etc. How does that sit with the approach that we've currently got about increasing the density within our environment? Do you believe we're going to be losing that sense of place that we've currently got? And if so, what do you think the impacts are going to be on the services, volunteer rates, and a few other implications from that? Thank you. If you're asking me, I would say that's why my definition is supposed definition of sustainability is far broader than just financial. Because I think the moment that you start um, looking at sustainability only the, through the financial lens, in urban environments, the cost of infrastructure is so great that it forces more and more development. Because you're not going to make those investments with tax dollars unless there's some payback. That phenomena then forces what you've just described. So that's why, to me, sustainability has to do with, can you afford it? Even if you can afford it, do you really want it? Do you understand the consequences of what you're doing? Do you know the impact that's going to have on the, I'll say, the community nature of, uh, of those communities that care to look a certain way? Uh, and then, how do you mediate disputes when those folks who've always had it that way want it that way, and the rest of society's got a tax base that's paying for it to be different. So I think it raises all those questions when you say sustainability, and I can't, I can't figure out the answers for you because I think that's the hard work of slogging through it and understanding what the differences are, but also what the similarities are, and how you're using these very important instruments of public investment. You're, you're not a lot uh, greatly on volunteerism we've got many, many people volunteering. And part of the reason for that is their sense of community and the fact that their friends or neighbours volunteer. And I'm wondering if that's going to be broken down in the future for the development, and what can we do to compensate for that? Because clearly there's financial cost with that as well. You see, I don't think that... Uh I don't think we're necessarily going to see the breakdown of communities. The, the, the definition of community may take on a different uh, definition. Uh, what place means to people may be different. Again, because technology will play a role in all that. But what I do have a strong sense of is that if we're going to be vibrant local governments, and you can define how big or small that geography is, you're not there to create a protective cocoon that stops all these other phenomena from happening. You're there to give people an understanding because you're their leaders. You're there to explain the trade-offs. And you're there to then, unfortunately, have to make some of the tough decisions around what those compromises are going to have to be. So you can only, you, if you're only there to protect people, your job won't last long in a world that's so rapidly changing. Thank you. Thank you for stepping The Premier uh, mentioned said some very useful uh, cautions to us as, uh, as, as a level of local government, City of Yarra Premier, and well, former Premier. Uh, first of all, uh, you, you commented on uh, overconsumption, and unfortunately, uh, we are having Victoria plan as a freight state, Victoria freight state, but um, not as good as on the move. Uh, thank you. But uh, it, that means uh, Victoria consumption. You know, and uh, that's a real problem. But the other one was that you highlighted something that we all as a sector have to work on, and that is the impact of wage increases uh, and the impact on superannuation liability. And I will raise that at the board, you know, the board meeting tomorrow and how we deal with that. But the problem is, you talk about amalgamation, how you might deal with that if we don't get our house in order. Um, but we're at the beginning of uh, EB round, which will lock into place whatever is determined for three years. And uh, because there's a federal system, and you and I have some responsibility for that shift to the federal system of IR, uh, it means that that stays three, year, three years, whatever happens, whether there's amalgamations or rate capping. In the second year, there's amalgamations. We know the research that says it counts for more than 100,000 population tends to have. There's no cost. There are no economies of scale, or they're, they're doubtful. 
and indeed they're more, more costs in terms of uh, <coughs> coordination of the larger councils. So we, we've got to give you, as a matter of time, isn't it, uh, uh, if the, you bring those things in in advance of uh, in advance of the EB, will the EB being determined for three years? Mm. We, it's not going to be very helpful at all. And the government's had three years to think about it, nearly three years to think about it, and uh, it's, it's left it too late. Well, that may be the case. I've, I've had in the last few weeks some very interesting discussions with some senior unionists because I've argued with them that once this election's out of the way, the union movement's got to work closely with the government of the day, whoever forms that government, so that we can start putting our foot on the accelerator of growth again. If we don't do that, then the economy's going to continue to shrink, as is the threat for local government. I'd prefer not to see any more amalgamations. I'd rather see councils take the guest point, get all their finances in place, take on board the, the character of places so that we can build things which are at points of difference. But if we don't do that, then that's what's going to happen. So therefore, when we're talking about new employment agreements and so forth, we've got to talk with one voice. And we've actually got to get the union to and sit them down and say, well, look, you can force us to go higher. But look what's happened to us at the moment with this superannuation thing. This is because we've said it's now going to be fully funded. This is to protect both previous and current workers who are still on the old scheme. If we don't do this, we're going to be hit more, and that's going to put us at risk in terms of the people we're currently employed. We cannot afford more than 2%. Go and talk, take the people out if you wish, but at the end of the day, this is what leadership's about. This is what governance is about. We've said that. We yeah. don't negotiations like understand that, that, but I say we've got to... Well, if you go to 3 or 4%, then... I used yeah. the expression this morning, I won't use it again. But you're putting yourself at risk. And you're putting yourself at risk some of the people you currently employ. And you're certainly putting at risk your local community and place, the things that make the difference, because you're going to be hit again in three years. But in three years of my life, what did Yarra get hit this year? What was your call? Well, it's not being determined, but uh, it's certainly uh, in the three of you know, 3.5 to 4%. Uh, no, no, no. Or no, super, no. or super. Or super. Well, 11 million. 11 million, well. Good on you. You must be a very wealthy council. You pay that out in cash? <laughs> you pay to borrow. Exactly. Yet, so, no. what do you want to do? Yeah. Next time, mm -hmm. three years' time, you could be asked to be borrowing 21 million. You've got to start trying to put the stopper back in the box. And that's where the MAV and other organisations have got to work collectively. The councils have got to understand they've got to stop doing it. At least that component that you control. Otherwise, your points are different. Your characters so are all going to be lost. So will the government fully back local government if it does stand up? Because, well, I think uh, they should. We're and being attacked by the state government. I think they should, and you've got to work closely with them. <laughs> That's why I say, after this weekend, there's going to be a new order in town, I suspect. When we won in 92, you might remember we had that march of 100,000 people up and down the street here wanting every part of my anatomy. Uh, <laughs> while they were marching up and down, I had 17 trade unionists in my office. And I said to them, I don't care what you do publicly. Go and shout and scream and hold your banners up. But do you want to get this state moving again? Do you want to secure the work of your, your, your members and find... And they all said yes. Even the most left wing of them. So we had a two pizza movement going. They are protesting publicly, privately, we're all working together. That's what's got to happen. And it's got to happen at the federal, state and local government level. We can't continue to live beyond our means. Okay, good, good message. Now, last Can I question. just add one thing to that, Jackie? Have you conveyed in any way to your community that in terms of those negotiations, what sort of an impact it may have on their rates? We have regularly, I mean, we, we, we constantly ask for our rates, <coughs> and we have to explain to them that it is there, that 4% 4, 4 wage increase that we, it is across local government, I agree with the former Premier, that we, we it's, it's, it's something we, we've got to contain, especially how you that up, what supports you get, because there will be massive industrial unrest, uh, and we need to work through that. But we have, we discussed, and even at the last Saturday, in, 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 in,
like me, I've talked about people very concerned about their rate increase, particularly those who have had their properties devalued substantially in the path of the East Westing. They're very concerned about the disparity between what they have to pay until it's revalued in January. So we went through and discussed that and uh, the community know uh, the position we're in. Uh, but uh, the EV negotiations are essentially uh, done confidentially, but uh, we, we, need to, we need to think all of that through and it's a precaution. I think one of the other things too is in terms of community understanding cost imperatives of local government, most councils put a little notice in the paper in terms of their draft budget and say people are invited to a meeting on such and such a night. And that is the only way they communicate to their community that they have a capacity to discuss and maybe influence some of the council expenditure. And that's where we're talking about how we communicate. You know, is putting an ad in the paper, which is a legislative requirement, the only way you should do it. Should we be calling in the local press and saying, can you run an article on the front page? This is without prejudice. Talking of courage, this question is for Jeff Cannon. Please take a deep breath. I was told by many of the mainstream Australian friends that you did well for Victoria. However, in your last term, they saw that you gave instructions for the councils to be amalgamated. Take a deep breath again. Oscar. What was... Oscar. 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 I cannot understand. Then hold it. Let the meeting finish. You have, and I'll to, give me, no, you have to give me the time, my flow, not yours. Well, then the answer you is yes. You are not a premier. <laughs> so, you are the one who are giving... You, you are the one who gave councillors a lot of work and, and giving us peanuts. You know that. Give peanuts and get monkeys in the coming candidates. Now it's for you to talk. And the answer is still yes. <laughs> well, thanks for coming and can we thank the panel first.